Hi, I'm that Slavic writer guy, and today we're going to be talking about Verdi's La Traviata. This one is the story of a carefree courtesan who finds true love with a young aristocrat, despite the two of them never having met before Act 1. Find out how what almost started out as a total flop at one of Italy's most famous opera houses became one of today's more famous and widely performed of Verdi's works, Gremo Opero. La Traviata premiered at La Fenice in Venice on March 6, 1853. It was poorly received due to the fact that the tenor and the baritone, so the two main male leads of the opera, were considered to be not very good. And considering they have to do a lot of singing in this opera, that uh, understandably would be a downer, but also because the woman who played Valerie, the, the main hot young courtesan who is dying of consumption, uh, was perceived by the audience to be too old and fat-looking uh, to convincingly play a young courtesan who's sick. Uh, and I find this really interesting because often and nowadays the reason for, you know, it's not over till the fat lady sings is because um, uh, the rotund often and uh, 40 or 50-year-olds that you see playing these parts are the one with the the training and the experience and the main physical package that can deliver the singing that re the part requires well. Um, but apparently back in the day, um, uh, this was um, a problem for the local audiences in Venice at La Fenice. So they jeered it in one way because uh, the, the tenor and the baritone were bad, but also because the soprano singing the one of the lead roles was really good, but apparently was too old, fat, and healthy to convincingly play the part. I guess back in the day, you just couldn't win for trying. Um, this also was composed at a time during Verdi's life when he was in the process of starting up his own extramarital relationship with Giuseppina Strepioni, and when he is rumored to have passed off a secret love child with her as an orphan so he didn't bring more shame down upon his name uh, or his family. Um, but also at the time when he was in the process of disowning his own parents and basically kicking them out of his mansion because of their strong uh, objections to his non-marital relationship with Mr. Epioni. Um, so it's interesting to know how in this time, when Verdi also composed three operas within three years, uh, Regoletto, uh, La Traviata, and Il Travatore, that all of them centrally focus on themes relating to uh, father-child relationships, um, whether it's um, uh, the protectiveness of the daughter that ultimately is for naught in Regoletto, um, or in Il Travatore, which is this very convoluted plot about this woman uh, having to give up her child to a funeral pyre um, and then take revenge on it later on when that turns out to have been a mistake on her part and she raised another, her nemesis's kid as her own. Um, and, um, and then finally what we see here in La Traviata, which is a strained relationship, kind of like Verdi was having with his own parents, of parents who would not approve of or believe in the true love that he had found with this woman who was uh, perceived by society to not be a good breeding marital stock, uh, even though the two had found love and this causes problems. So again, we're seeing in this very operatically productive time of Verdi's life, uh, how his personal life, which he was very uptight and tight-lipped about, uh, might have strongly reflected on his work. So without further ado, let's get to our cast of characters. First off, we've got Violetta, a courtesan who lives in Paris. She's a soprano who has to show off a lot of her coliatura skill, especially in Act One. Uh, next, we've got Alfredo Germont. Uh, he is from a uh, French aristocratic family. He's our main tenor in the opera who falls head over heel and has been head over heel uh, for uh, Valeria, Violetta, and her looks um, for the past year, in fact, but is only meeting her just now. Then we've got uh, Giorgio Germont. He is Alfredo's father, and as I may have alluded to a bit earlier in this talk, an asshole. 
um, who basically screws up things for the happy couple, only to realize what a total asshole he's been uh, right towards the end of the opera. Uh, moving on to some more minor characters who are important that you're going to see in the staging and the set direction of the opera. There's uh, Gaston, uh, Alfredo's friend, who formally introduces uh, Violetto and Alfredo at the beginning of the novel. And then there's also uh, Flora. She's Valeria's friend who invites her back to party in Paris when uh, her love life looks like it's gotten totally derailed by Mr. Asshole, the father. Um, and then we've got Baron Dufault, uh, who is, um, uh, as we meet him at the beginning of the opera, uh, Violetta's current sugar daddy, uh, as it were. And then beyond that, there are some more minor uh, singing characters, and they're basically just a bunch of uh, servants that are showing up with various uh, letters and uh, things throughout the course of the opera. Now that we've got that passed under our belt, uh, let's move swiftly to Act One of La Traviata. We start off at uh, Violetta's uh, very posh apartment in Paris, where she has thrown a party in order to celebrate her recovery from a mysterious disease that it quickly becomes apparent that she has not all that much actually recovered from. Um, so during the party, um, uh, Alfredo's friend, uh, Gaston, shows up and uh, tells uh, Violetta that Alfredo is actually uh, like in love with how hot she is, having uh, pined away for her for basically the past year. Um, and uh, Valeria then uh, exhorts um, one of the, the guests to uh, sing a toast to how wonderful her party she is. And um, uh, her current sugar daddy, uh, um, Dufault basically refuses to do this because he's a total killjoy. And then everyone falls back on Alfredo, who uh, sings um, uh, a Brindisi and uh, one of the most uh, famous drinking songs in uh, all of opera and one of the most famous songs uh, actually in the operatic world. I am not going to actually put this on full screen because if you have not heard, heard it, chances are you are either a two-year-old or you're dead. So he sings that. It's really famous. Um, and uh, then the desk guests go off to dance, and uh, Violetta is still too sick to dance, so she uh, stays behind in her chamber, leaving her and uh, Alfredo alone. And so uh, he confesses his love to her, and uh, she is kind of, you know, keeping up her nose in the air, but uh, he keeps after it. Her and she says, yeah, you know, well, I'm a, a total uh, gold digger. And so if you just love me that much, it's just a bunch of BS to me. But, um, you know, maybe you can return back tomorrow with this flower and, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, and it turns out that once Alfredo leaves, that um, uh, she actually is thinking that she might have feelings for him, depending, you know, just uh, judging by having met him exactly that once. Uh, and so she really gives some serious consideration to, oh my God, could he be the one um, in, in an aria? Um, but she concludes in the end uh, that um, uh, she really likes her life of uh, gold digging and... Uh, uh, flitting around uh, the posh uh, society crowd of Paris. Act 2, Scene 1. Months have gone by, and we now find uh, Alfredo and Violetta at um, uh, a country house uh, where they're living uh, on the outskirts of Paris. Um, and this country life is apparently quite expensive because uh, Violetta uh, is gone as we open Act to scene one, um, to sell off all of her uh, horses and carriages and whatnot in order to be able to afford their, you know, uh, peaceful bucolic life uh, that her and Alfredo are living, um, which makes you wonder how much gold digging she had to do in the first place to afford all of those things, but apparently she has them. Um, and uh, Alfredo is also apparently loaded because when he walks in and she finds out that she's gone to try to do this, he uh, vows that he is going to take good care of his uh, true love and uh, provide for them himself anyway. Um, 
So he goes off and heads for Paris to, uh, I guess, get her horses and carriages back and pay for all of their various bills himself. Um, when uh, uh, Alfredo's dad shows up while uh, uh, Violetta is there home alone. Um, and uh, she at first rebuffs him when he uh, basically says that it's improper for my son to be in a relationship that's not marriage uh, with or with you um, and, and living here, and it reflects badly on me and my family, so I want you to go. And at first she says no, but um, then uh, uh, Alfredo's dad comes back and says, Oh, God, but please, if you have any decency left, I have this daughter and her marriage or engagement to someone else is going to go away because my son is living in sin here with you. Um, and uh, instead of, you know, basically reacting like you may think she should have acted and gone, um, well, you know what? If the family that your daughter is marrying into has a problem with it, that's the problem of their stick up their ass. So fuck off and go away. She goes, well, I'm not completely heartless, and so I will leave him um, for the sake of my son's uh, vic very Victorian honor and um, for, for the sake of your daughter and your family. But she does this um, in a duet um, where she's crying and saying she'll have to let him go, and uh, the dad is going, oh, I know it's so terrible, but thank, thank you for doing the right thing for me and my family. Just thank you so much. Well... Violetta is clearly, like, bawling her eyes out over this, um, uh, having to leave the man she, she loved because of societal expectations. Uh, so she goes along with it, and she writes a Dear John letter to Alfredo, um, and then decides to go to a party in Paris that her friend has, has invited her to. Um, so she goes off, and then... Um, uh, she, she gives the letter to a courier uh, for, for Alfredo to find, which he does upon his return. Um, and he reads it and is like, what the fuck? Out of the blue, she just dumps me and runs off. Um, but uh, this, his suspicions are really heightened shortly uh, after, um, shortly after he reads this letter and he's back at home, that who should show up but his dad? Um, now, the two of them uh, basically... Uh, go on um, uh, to sing, um, uh, obviously to sing in an opera, but um, uh, he goes on to then sing uh, this really great song, which I personally think it's the best thing in the opera and um, the best uh, kind of fuck you that's ever getting given to a parent uh, in, in all of opera that... Um, uh, the father then just goes on this this entire aria about, oh, well, how has uh, your home and family fled from your heart and honor fled from your heart um, that have caused you to do this? And um, if there's any honor in you left and you come back to living uh, with us and in our right societal way, then God will have listened to my prayers. All the while, not understanding, while his son is going like, no, no, you're an asshole. Um, for not uh, agreeing with what he wants for the sake of his father wanting it. Um, uh, but uh, having read this letter, even though he's suspicious of it, um, he eventually uh, uh, agrees to do this, but at the same time then gets really, really uh, mad at Violetta, thinking that she's actually dumped him anyway. Um, so... Uh, uh, he gets it in his head that he's going to go to this party too and publicly shame her. And then all of a sudden the dad's like, no, no, I didn't mean that you should publicly shame her. I just wanted you to get out of her life. Even though he doesn't really say that, he's just like, no, no, I didn't mean for you to do that. Um, but uh, really pissed off now that, that uh, Violetta has dumped him, uh, he runs off to the party. Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, we're now at Violetta's friend's party, uh, where kind of the talk of the town is that Alfreda and Violetta have now broken it off, um, which is really weird because everyone who knew them was like, wow, we thought that this was really going to be like a uh, forever kind of a thing. Um, so, you know, once they've done that, there's then this whole disvertissement that goes on with the entertainers at her party uh, showing up and pretending to be a bunch of Spanish dancers and matadors. 
Uh, that being done, the, uh, Valerie herself, Violetta, shows up uh, with her old sugar daddy, apparently having patched things up with him. And uh, he goes over to Alfredo, who's now showed up, who's now gambling. Um, and uh, he sees uh, uh, Dufault, the old sugar daddy, and is like, um, well, I still think this bitch is mine, and I'm going to take her home with me. Um, which this, of course, uh, enrages Dufault, and so they uh, decide to get this little dick measuring contest done uh, with uh, a few rounds of high-stakes gambling, uh, all of which uh, Alfredo wins, winning him a shit ton of money. Um... Alfredo's kind of going on bragging about, you know, how much he's won and how he's going to take her back with him uh, when she kind of, uh, you know, says, uh, you know, don't be too loud and in uh, to false face and tries to get him to go away. And Alfredo takes this to mean, well, I really uh, would rather be with this Baron than you and I never loved you. Um, and so he basically in front of the whole party is like, uh, you know, uh, tell this whole party that you were with me and now you've dumped him for another man because... He stress, uh, happened to strike your fancy again. And uh, knowing that she has to keep up the charade that she doesn't really love Alfredo, that she's agreed to with Alfredo's father, she admits to it. Um, at which point, Alfredo loses his shit and basically calls to the whole party and says, here, pay attention. And he proceeds to throw and rain money down on Violetto, basically saying, look at this bitch, look at this whore. Uh, this is me paying her for her services. And this shocks all the guests um, that he would actually call a, a courtesan out on what she's doing. Um, and conveniently, uh, Alfred, Alfredo's father picks this time to enter, and knowing that the whole thing is all an act on, 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 on uh, uh, Valeria Violetta's part, uh, basically goes to his son, how dare you do that and call out this shame on a woman directly to her face? Um, which, you know, okay, so first of all, he didn't want the son to be with her because she's a whore, and now he's yelling at his son for proclaiming her to be a whore that he's no longer with. I mean, if I were Alfredo, I would be away from this sanctimonious asshole so fast it would make your head spin. Um, but, um... In all of this, uh, there's so much commotion that uh, Violetta, who's really still six, faints again, but then when she's kind of in blah blah land and she's tugs out, oh, really, Alfredo, I still really loved you. Um, and uh, so with that, it is the end of Act 2. Act 3. Um, we are now in uh, Valeria Violetta's bedroom. Uh, and she is being told while carnival is going on outside um, that uh, by her doctor that she does not have much longer to live before consumption takes her. And um, again, a few months have passed uh, since the fiasco at uh, Violetta's friend's party. And so uh, she reads a letter that she's gotten um, from Alfredo uh, and uh, basically says that... Um, um, uh, the Baron, uh, Dufault, was only wounded in the duel that uh, uh, Dufault fought with him, and that after that, Alfredo has gone and done some traveling abroad. Um, but, uh, you know, once he can come back after that whole deal with the duel that he caused because of his behavior at the party, um, uh, uh, that he's, he's planning to return um, to uh, apologize to her for what he did. Um, and Valeria is sitting there worrying if he's going to come back before she's dead, actually. And uh, right in the nick of time, um, Alfredo shows up and they are happily reunited um, and planning, uh, or at least uh, pipe dreaming about uh, their future together. Um, but really, they kind of both know that it's too late for her and she already has one foot in the grave already. Um, so they sing a final love duet. Uh, Alfredo's father is dead and enters apologizing for the whole thing, finally realizing at the end too late what a complete douche face he's been. Um, and then uh, Valeria following their final duet 
uh, feels like she feels the life is uh, returning to her body from it, but really that's only her soul leaving and she dies. Curtain falls. The end. So that is La Traviata, um, which, you know, to, to, to modern audiences, who's going with who and who's not happy about it is really just uh, the, the trait of gossip uh, you know, ever since, uh, you know, high school and beyond. But way back in 1853, when this premiered, um, the whole idea that this this courtesan, this uh, high-class gold digger, um, who is not a woman of so-called virtue, could find true love and actually be virtuous and honorable at the same time, um, was actually really quite a racy idea uh, to be portrayed on the stage and actually... The, 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 the high society guy who came after her and, and uh, denied that it was true, um, her father, sorry, Alfredo's father, um, who's brought too late in the end to see that she really could have virtue, was really quite a shocky, racy thing uh, for the, the Victorian audiences uh, of the time. And that's what, li- what Verdi liked to do with a lot of his operas, kind of push that edge. Um, and kind of tell people to, you know, hey, get with modern times a bit. Um, And as I said earlier in this talk, um, it really, I think, reflects a lot on him getting into this uh, relationship with uh, Giuseppina Strapiotti and uh, with all of the high society flack that he he had to take from daring to say that, uh, you know, me and this woman of the same age happen to be soulmates and soul partners, which they were for the rest of Verdi's life. Uh, and if we just want to be together with no marriage, no nothing, no whatever, that's our business. And you can all F off, especially in the context of Verdi at that time having to uh, disown and kick, uh, kick his own parents out of the house for it. So really, I think I just see Verdi writing this going, you're an asshole, dad. Uh, and I'm going to make it with this, this woman who I really love. But of course, since this was an opera, it had to have a tragic ending. Um, so uh, one more thing before I go. Um, shameless plug for my latest release, quite a thick one. Um, it's the latest book in my hit series, uh, The Russia Chronicles, book five, Katya of Russia, in which case uh, a girl from the streets who actually has a high uh, aristocratic board uh, background uh, together with uh, her American uh, lover, um, have to uh, go through a lot of trials and tribulations, breaking into some of uh, Russia's most fortified facilities and popping off some of its most uh, uh, infamous leaders and dictators in order to take over Russia. Now in this one, if you like reading, um, they have to maintain their hold on power. Uh, so um, with that... The book is Book 5, Katya of Russia in the Russia Chronicles. Um, and uh, this, as you have just seen, um, another story about a very unconventional young woman and how she has to take the flack uh, for, after finding true love for nothing but uh, society's senseless expectations. So there you have it. Uh, subscribe to this channel or don't. Like it or don't. I'm that Slavic writer guy. I am going to do what I do regardless of what the fuck you think about it. Um, So that's that. Uh, Goodbye till we see each other again here on YouTube. And as we say in Slovenia, Nasvidenia.